Okay, this is ILT C30. Again, we're still on the whole idea of injective, but now we've got a different kind of transformation. Uh, this one maps a 2 2 matrix to a uh, P3 polynomial, and, and here's the definition of it. So it takes A, B, C, D, and it maps it into a polynomial function like this. So it asks us two questions. We first want to find uh, whether T is injective or not, and actually I'll wait and answer that one afterwards. And then we want to find the kernel. The kernel basically is what we looked at in the previous example. The kernel basically looks at uh, the set that uh, comes from uh, producing zero. So suppose this linear transformation produces a zero polynomial. The question is, what are the limits on A, B, C, and D in order to produce that? Is it one-to-one? -one? If it is one-to-one, -one, then it's injective. But if it's not one-to-one, -one, then it will prove to be non-injective. And we can answer that question by finding the kernel. And then I'll show you a way that we can answer it even quicker. Okay, so in essence, we wanna solve this problem right here. So we've got a form a matrix, which is equivalent to this guy's transformation. And that's pretty easy to do. It's gonna be a three row matrix, one row for uh, the constant, one row for the linear, and one row for the quadratic polynomial. So our first row is gonna be A plus B equals zero. Our next row is gonna be A plus C equals zero. And our third row is gonna be A plus D equals zero. So we wanna turn that into a matrix. So there's A, B, C, and D, so it's got four columns. It's gonna be one, one, zero, zero and then one, zero, one, zero, and then one, zero, zero, one. Again, I'll need to add a row of all zeros in order to do the RF for this, but this basically describes how the coefficients are related to the polynomial that it forms. And in order for this to be a zero polynomial, again, these would all be zeros over here. So we're just looking for the null space of this matrix. And you'll notice that the kernel is strongly related to null space because if you're looking at the uh, pre-image of producing the zero as a solution, you're very much solving a matrix that gives you zero, which is really what the null set of the matrix is, and that's kind of how the kernel's defined. So when we run this through the RF process, this is what we get. We get uh, one, zero, zero, one. We get zero, one, zero, negative one. We get zero, zero, one, negative one, and all zeros. So that means uh, we've got three pivot rows, R equals three, but N equals four. Uh, we've got uh, uh, basically fixed solution D on one, two, and three. And, uh, and our free row is four. So that means D is the free variable and uh, one uh, A, B, and C are all functions of D. So if we wrote a column vector that represented the solution set, it would look like this. A would equal negative D, oops, negative D. Uh, B would equal D, C would equal D, and D of course would equal D. So removing the Ds, that really produces a spanning set of negative one, 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 one. Now let's not forget what the input of this looked like, right? A, B, C, and D were actually in a matrix. So I've drawn this as a column vector, but it really isn't. Uh, my T to the minus one of zero is really the spanning set of this. So it's negative one, 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 one. And let's make that a set and then let's span it. And uh, that's also equal to the kernel of T. And of course, because this is a spanning set, it has way more than one way to get here. And because of that, it's not injective. But we could have told that at the beginning. And here's the reason why. Remember the input for these functions, T is considered U, and the output is uh, V. And uh, there's a theorem that says the dimension uh, dim of U has to be uh, greater than or equal. Oh, excuse me. I got that backwards, less than or equal to the dim of V. And of course, we can see that the dimension here is four and the dimension here is three. And when that's the case, if this, is, if this does not hold true, then uh, it is non-injective. Otherwise, 
not injected. And so we could have told that right at the beginning because of the dimensions of this, that this could not be injective. But it was nice to actually prove it by showing that uh, the image space was basically a uh, set of matrices as opposed to just one. And that set, of course, is the kernel. So they kind of led us to this a little bit. We could have told it was injective at the beginning, but we can also tell it's injective by looking at the nature of the kernel. And that's it.